What's up, witches, and welcome to Salem, the weirdest place on Earth. My guest today is the creator of the occult tarot, which if you are watching the video, you're seeing me now kind of fan through here on the screen. We're looking at sort of, there you go, there's one right there. I'm showing on the screen the Ace of Pentacles, which is a cool little demon that gives all worldly power and treasures and makes one rich quickly. Couldn't we all use a little bit of that? His name is Travis McHenry, and this is not all he does. In addition to being a fascinating occultist and esotericist, Travis has been, throughout the years, and some of these he still is, he has been literally the ruler of his own country. He has been in the United States Navy as an intelligence officer. He has been uh, an occultist, not just in the way of tarot, but writing books and stuff too, a paranormal investigator, a CEO, an actor, a writer, a director. It's all over the place. I'm probably missing a few. This is definitely an episode to check out if you are at all interested in the current sort of state of affairs of esotericism in the West world, some ways that esoteric thought might offer us avenues out of what Travis and I explore might be potentially like flaws in the Western way of seeing our value set. If you're interested in what it's like to create a tarot deck, a series of tarot decks and have them put out into the world, if you're interested in climate change and want to hear a really, really cool accounting of what one person is doing to make a difference, if you are or know some military personnel and want to hear someone talk pretty openly about what it was like to serve, what they wish people knew about uh, what it was like to serve, this is definitely the episode for you. You can find links to all of Travis's stuff in the various descriptions, whether you are watching or listening to this, it's down there somewhere. Check it out. Uh, I was thrilled to have him on the show. I'm so, so happy he said yes. I am personally using the occult tarot literally as we speak and have been for the past month and a half or so. So this is a really, really fantastic conversation and I'm so, so glad he could join me. I hope you enjoy. Here is the interview with Travis McHenry. Travis McHenry, uh, I, I am so excited to talk to you for a, a number of reasons. Uh, so thank you so much for being here, first of all. Um, absolute pleasure to have you. Uh, as, as guests might have heard a little bit in the intro, you're a man of, of many hats. Um, yes. <laughs> when I went to your website initially, I, I, I first got exposed to you through, through this little thing right here. This is the uh, Occult oh, nice. Tarot, um, which just randomly showed up in my feed somewhere and I got it right. and fell in love with it. And so then went to look into you and stumbled upon your website where I was greeted with eight distinct <laughs> categories. Uh, I'll just list these off because I think we're going to be talking about all of them. Okay. So the eight categories that you have on the front page of your personal <laughs> website are occultist, CEO, podcast host, author and adventurer, actor, musician, filmmaker, and visionary environmentalist. Yes. First question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what is up with all this diversity? So many of these things I don't really actively do anymore. For example, uh, the podcast, I think I recorded my last episode three years ago, uh, but they're still out there for people to enjoy. Acting, I have not acted um, since 2013, really, uh, in, in a meaningful way. Um, and uh, I sort of turned my back on that. And then uh, filmmaking, same thing. I think I made my last real movie, 2000. 16 was the last time I actually shot film for like something semi-professional. And then the rest of them are things that I'm actually doing now. Gotcha. So <clears throat> let's, let's jump into the acting thing a bit. Um, okay. you, the, the, the phrase turn my back on um, <laughs> that you just used that it feels a little bit loaded. Is there, was there, was it there is. something that happened um, with acting? You know, I, I actually sort of started my existence as a writer when I was about 13 years old, I started writing. And from that, I, I actually got seduced into acting. Um, when I was 15, I got cast in a school play and I had so much uh, positive uh, response from my performance. I mean, the principal of the high school who he didn't know me from anybody came up to me, shook my hand and pulled me in close and said, you were simply amazing. And that was the first time anybody had said that to me in any capacity. Right. So, um, so that got me excited about acting and, and I was still writing, but that sort of took a back burner. And um, so I started acting and I acted uh, through college. I pursued a theater degree. And then I got 
to a point where I said, you know, this is stupid. What am I doing with my life? And decided to join the Navy. There's more to that. But um, I was in the Navy for eight years. And while I was in the military, I rediscovered my love for acting. I was sitting in a play in 2007. It was the first play I'd been to in years. And I started crying during the play. And I thought, oh my God, what's wrong with me? You know, I'm a, I'm a tough guy. I'm not supposed to be doing this. And from that moment forward, that started this journey back into acting. And so in 2008, I came to California to be a professional actor. I mean, I got, I'd been cast in a ton of stuff when I was still in Virginia and had really had some pretty impressive success actually. And then came to California and it's a whole different ball game out there, you know? Um, yeah. But I pursued it very hardcore for seven years, just as a professional actor, no other job. And um, <laughs> after seven years, man, I, I looked at myself in the mirror and said, do you want to be something with your life or do you want to keep trying to be an actor? So I decided to literally turn my back on it. And I was still getting calls for, for auditions and roles and everything else. I said, I'm, I'm out, I'm done. Wow. Wow. I did almost the exact same thing, yeah. believe it or not. Yeah. But, but East Coast went to right, New York right. and, nice. and tried that for a few years. And yeah. you know what it was for me? I mean, I'd be curious. I, I, I'm curious to, to hear a bit more what you mean. Um, maybe a little bit of the story of transitioning from acting to the Navy. But for, for me, I was in this play. And it's so crazy that all of these things were happening at around the same time. I was in this play in Massachusetts in the Berkshires, like doing nice. summer stock up there. Right. Yeah. And I was being directed by, um, I guess I shouldn't say his name probably, but I was being directed <laughs> by this, this Pulitzer Prize winning, Tony winning author director oh. guy. And it was a great play. There's nothing wrong with it. But around the same time, not to get too heavy too quickly, but I imagine we're going to get heavy pretty quickly anyway, yeah. so might as well go for it. Um, Around the same time, my sister, who, who had been battling cancer for about a year and a half up to that point, started to take a turn and it was starting to become clear she wasn't going to make it out of this, which she ultimately didn't. So in that summer, where I'm doing that summer stock and her health starts taking a turn, I'm like backstage at this theater, looking at all these other actors around me, some of whom are like, you know, there was a guy in this play who opened the role of Amadeus or opened the role of Mozart in Amadeus on Broadway. Oh, and now he's it's yeah. very impressive. And right, he was right. a great actor, but now he's yeah. in his late 60s yeah. doing summer stock, getting paid like 300 bucks a week. And I was just looking around like what the thing was in my head was like, it doesn't seem to matter what I do, you know, like it doesn't seem to matter how hard I work. <laughs> what training I go for, because I was training with like really good teachers and, right. you know, well-known. There doesn't seem to be a pathway towards ever, not, not just financial success, but ever actually doing the kind of work I want to do. Was that similar right. for you? Right. Uh, it was exactly the same, actually. You know, in 2012, which is the year before I quit acting, I did 20, 20 different plays, stage performances, movies, TV shows, all you know wow. wide gambit of stuff 20 different productions that's insane and 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 busted my ass and you know what i didn't have to audition for not one of them wow i was just called and said hey travis we need you to do this for 20 different productions and i had made that year like 259 dollars so and i was constantly working as a professional actor so that was a, a huge eye opener for me and then you know, in 2013, I took one big, huge risk. Um, I actually went to, to New York and auditioned for a Broadway show, George Taikei's uh, Allegiance. Oh, when yeah. He was going to Broadway. So I met George in Los Angeles and he took to me right away. He actually invited me to come audition. And it was still a couple years away, though. And I get this phone call from Tesla and Company, who is one of the biggest New York casting agents uh, in the entire city. Yeah. So they call me and say, hey, Travis, George recommended you. We'd like you to come in. Here's all your sides and the songs you have to learn. You have four days <laughs> and, and we, need, well, we need you in New York. So um, oh, it, was, it was crazy. So I go into to that audition and uh, my singing is not that great. I, I'm the first one to admit that. My acting is where I'm supposed to shine. Well, I got about halfway through my first song and they just sort of shook their heads. And I said, would you like to hear another song? And they said, no. So I, I walked out of the audition. I, I started crying before I even got to the lobby. It was awful. Yeah. And then I took my songbook and threw it into the big dumpster and, 
and that was the end of it for me. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, it's brutal, man. It's brutal. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Um, so, so these days you're, you're, you're what, you're editing, you're finishing this, this film Cult of Cthulhu, right? Is that the stage that that's in? Well, um, so I started filming Cult of the Cthulhu was going to be my, my, this sort of great, um, auteur film that I, that I was creating. And I got about a third, maybe a quarter of the way into filming it and, uh, realized the final scenes that I needed to shoot. I just didn't have the money for the for the budget for that. And I thought, well, I'm probably not going to have the money for the budget uh, for a while because they need computer effects and all this kind of stuff. I want Cthulhu like rising out of the ocean while this woman is being sacrificed on the beach in front of him. I thought that'd be an awesome shot. And I thought, if I can't have that, I can't shoot this movie. And um, so I stopped shooting it while waiting for funds to come in and maybe getting a special effects producer to come on board. And that was, that was three years ago or four years wow. ago now. So uh, at this point now, I've changed so much physically, I, I couldn't go back and, and be that same character. So I would probably have to completely start from scratch, do wow. reshoots. And actually, one of my actresses now lives in Germany. You know, she shot most of her scenes, but she's in Germany now. I'm not going to pay the flyer back. <laughs> right, so, right. So. I, uh, oh, man, that's rough. Um, yeah. uh, <laughs> Are you thinking so Cult of Cthulhu is in progress, but you know what? There's enough interest in it that in the next year or two. Um, I mean, if a lot of people would like to see that movie and I've got a trailer out there, people can watch. Uh, I would be happy to do a, a crowdfunder, a crowdfunder and, you know, raise money on Kickstarter to actually get the, the budget really needed to make a good film. And also I would not start it at this point. I would let somebody else be the lead actor and I'll just direct. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe a ca cameo or something. Was this your first film directing? It was not actually. I directed a movie back in two, 99, 2000, somewhere back in there called Bedrick's Fifth. And it was a, a, a student project, but we did it as a, like a professional film. And uh, it was about a clone and this film crew is following around a clone. And you don't know that he's, he's been cloned. You just think he's a weirdo. And uh, by the end of the movie, he murders the entire film crew. He kills uh, his girlfriend and he kills the film crew. Nice. And uh, it's, it's really, and it's an allegory. He's wearing a dress the entire time. So it's an allegory for you know, somebody who's like closeted or, or, or transsexual or something like that. But you find out at the very end, the government has mandated that clones wear dresses as this kind of uniform to identify. So that's interesting. That's, it, it's really, really a cool movie. I remember my dad watched it uh, during one of our first screenings and he, he sees me walking down the street, just like a public street, wearing this dress. And remember, this is 1999. He turns to me and he says, wow, you're brave. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever worn a dress in public now that you mention it. I've been in Rocky get, Horror get three times, but that's it. Oh, nice. <laughs> I, I got a lot of cat calls, but it was generally a positive experience. That's good. You should do it more. <laughs> um, I, I want to pivot a little bit to, uh, to Bloodstone Studios, um, what you're the CEO of, right? I am, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so they've been around for, for two years, and, and uh, they produced this deck, among others, the Occult Tarot. That, well, uh, uh, actually, no. So, so uh, I'll, I'll take you back to 2018. So I had been working in corporate America for about five years, and I was pretty burnt out. I didn't want to have a corporate job anymore. So I uh, kind of got myself fired, and uh, so I was able to collect unemployment while I figured out what the hell I wanted to do with my life. Good call. And during that time period, I had already designed what you know as the occult tarot, but it was originally called the demon possessed tarot. So I had already designed that deck and a friend suggested, hey, why don't you put it on Kickstarter? Well, I didn't really know how to do that. But so I went ahead and got a campaign together and it was so successful. I didn't want that money to come into my personal account and be you know, taxed as income. So I started a corporation around it called Bloodstone Studios. And I also realized, hey, I can make, I can just continue making tarot decks. I have a lot of really good ideas. And I, the follow-up deck to that Demon Possessed Tarot came out, I think, three months later, which is amazing time for a really Kickstarter quick. to turn around and, yeah. and do another Kickstarter. And, uh, and then another deck after that called the, Occult, uh, the, the Oracle of Heaven and Hell, and then the Tarot of Vlad Dracula, and then the current deck, uh, the Hieronymus Bosch Tarot. 
Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. So that's the one I just released. So what you've got is I'll hold it up. In, so while you're talking, yeah, they can yeah. see it. Uh, here, here, I, I, I brought props. So oh, nice. Look at you. <laughs> so the occult tarot was originally called the demon possessed tarot. And then the angel tarot was originally called uh, the angel evoking tarot. Now I met a guy named Paul in, um, in 2019 at a psychic conference. And he actually, it happens to be the publisher of one of the, one of the biggest tarot and mind body spirit publishing companies in the world, right? They're, they happen to be based out of Australia. And he took one look at my demon possessed tarot and said, do you have a distributor yet? Do you have a publisher yet? I said, no, I, I've just been doing it myself. So he immediately licensed the rights and then we negotiated for the angel evoking tarot. And so they actually have licensed my images and my, you know, sort of intellectual property surrounding those decks um, and then repackage them in some, something that's a little bit more commercial friendly, as I would call it. The original demon possessed tarot is highly, highly coveted by the people that have it. And there's a lot of people out there that want it because it's very rough. It looks like it's original pages ripped from an old book. Wow. And you really feel the energy in that deck in the original deck. It's like, it, it's literally like it's cursed, which wow. is how I designed it. So even I am afraid to use it. I only use it once a year. I always tell people that. <laughs> but, um, and the, the angel evoking tarot is very similar, but with a very positive energy. So, um, yeah, these reprints are really, really cool. You know, they're much more commercialized. They're, they're friendly for a larger audience. And I mean, hell, I, I can walk into Barnes and Noble and find my, my decks on the shelf. And there's something That's to be said for that. That's got to feel really cool. It does. I, I actually started crying the very first time I saw them on the shelf at Barnes and Noble. Yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. Wow. So Rockpool really handles sort of what I call the mass market versions of my decks. And they've already licensed that. I actually have another deck coming out through them. This is the original, the Tarot of Vlad Dracula. Um, and you can see it's sort of got this very rough, you know, old sort of look to it. Yeah. And their version is much more clean, much more uh, crisp. And actually what they did was, you can see here, you know, that it's like all woodcuts. Yeah. So they actually went through and had me colorize all the woodcuts. So it's almost like the Rider weight deck in terms of the, the colorization process. That's really cool. So yeah, so so that those are and and again, those have already been pre-ordered by by Barnes and Noble and, and all these other companies. So it's very, very exciting. So that's Rockpool. They actually handle my my second edition of decks. Gotcha. So so what is it? I mean, I just noticed in in the decks, especially, there seems to be a decided attraction to kind of goetic Solomonic yes. stuff. Yes. Uh, yeah. Where does that come from for you, and 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 why does that specific area of the occult hold your interest? Um, well, it's one of the oldest forms of ritual magic that have has survived to the present day, and that is really, really what attracts me to it. Because if it didn't work, it wouldn't have survived to the present day. If it was a faulty system, people would have changed it, and it survived the rituals, the sigils, all that stuff is is basically what it was at this point now, 1400 years ago or 1600 years ago, since the first few Goetic uh, texts were created. And it's the same thing with Kabbalistic magic. And those two traditions are actually very closely connected. Um, Goetic magic is practically Kabbalistic magic. It's sort of the, the alternate side of the tree of life. Um, and because you've got the 72 angels of the Kabbalah and the 72 demons of the Goetta that are diametrically opposed to each other. The angels rule over the demons. And they both um, capture aspects of those astrological decans, which the Egyptians created. Um, it's all really linked into and based on that. And again, if it didn't work, you know, the same thing with our zodiac, our, our, our 12 position zodiac. If, if it didn't have some truth to it, people wouldn't still be talking about it 2,000 years after it was created. Right, right. Um, so <clears throat> that's fascinating, man. Um, I've never really thought about... Uh, the Kabbalistic as a, you, what was it? Kabbalistic as practical application? Is that what you said? Uh, no, no, it's, it's the, it's opposing to, to Goetic magic, but they are connected. They're, right. they're, they, they actually come from the exact same tradition. And most of the older books, the Clavicle of Solomon will have some, and there's so many versions of that, by the way, you, you can't say there's one definitive version. So you have to really go back very far to the old um, magical texts from the 1400s, 1500s. And you look at those, they talk about the Goetic spirits and the Kabbalistic spirits um, 
you know, like just one chapter after the other, that kind of a thing. Wow. So are you, are you, do you consider yourself a, like a, a, a practicing ritual magician? Uh, I would not generally tell people that, but yeah, I guess that's probably the truth. Um, okay. yeah, I, I use ritual magic, um, uh, to, to make, yeah, to affect my environment, to affect the outcome. So yeah. And I, I read, uh, somewhere, I love this quote. I mean, I want to hear, I definitely want to hear this story. Uh, <laughs> I, I came across somewhere that your journey kind of into occultism, while it was always a fascination for you, really kicked off around 1990 where you somehow stumbled into a secretive coven of, yeah. of witches. What, what happened there? Well, it was actually 98, I think, was when that happened. So I first started to get involved in, in tarot cards in uh, 1993 when I got my first deck. But I didn't really understand the symbology behind it. I knew that there was a deeper meaning behind the cards, but I didn't know what it was. So I sort of put it on the back burner and would play with them once in a while, but I never even understood how to read tarot cards. And then in 96, uh, I was only 16, by the way, I decided to start a 10 year study into paranormal activity. I wanted, and, and Bigfoot and UFOs. My goal was to try and solve or at least get clues to those three key sort of unexplained phenomena. And as part of that, I, this guy I know named Phil, he uh, introduced me to this haunted cemetery. He said, there's a, a really evil witch coven leader. His name's Dr. Santee. He's buried there. He died in 1980. And his coven still comes around the cemetery. So you got to be careful if you go there at night. Well, I remember I went there on Sam Hain, which would actually be October 30th, the evening leading into October 31st. And this cemetery out in the middle of absolutely nowhere in the middle of Pennsylvania was there were tons of cars and parking lot at midnight. And I thought, holy shit, this is for real. So I started investigating this guy's life. And again, he had been dead at that point for 16 years. But in the process of investigating his life, um, I caught the attention of the coven because I was putting stuff online and trying to get more information about him and even went to where his old house was and all that kind of stuff. And they were extremely angry with me because I was putting out that narrative that Phil had told me where he's leading this evil coven of, of, of really dangerous witches. And as it turns out, they're very lovely people. Um, <laughs> after I sort of gained their trust a little bit, I was actually able to talk to their high priestess who sadly has passed now. But um, I, I gave a really long phone interview with her. And then after that, some of the other witches came forward and shared pictures, actual photographs they sent me of them with Dr. Santee and told me all about his coven, which is called the Coven of the Cata. It's based out of Pennsylvania, sort of central Pennsylvania, and it's still going to this day. It's, it's amazing. Oh. Yeah, and, and they just that experience of, of learning a little bit more about their rituals, because they even shared with me like their ritual handbook and everything. Um, learning about their process and learning about their rituals uh, opened my eyes to the occult in a much greater way. And that process started in 1998, but it probably took until 2006 or so to, to make, do all those interviews and have that sort of awakening experience. Yeah. Uh, wow, that's fascinating. Do, do you still keep in touch with the, the coven? So actually, the two contacts that I had have both passed away. I mean, the, because the coven was started in 52, I think, or 48, somewhere back there. Mm -hmm. So it's, most of their members are, are really getting up there. But there are a few younger members who, who I'm just not in contact with. Oh, I got gotcha. you. And, and you wrote about him since he did you in uh, memoir I, in, I uh, Into the Abyss? I did. Yeah, I have a whole chapter devoted to him there. And that is actually going to be revisited in my next book, which is called uh, Magicians, Martyrs, and Madmen. It's basically biographies of all these people throughout history, some of whom were notorious, some of whom were not, but all who had some kind of a dealing with the supernatural or with magic. And I have a whole, the, that chapter gets expanded on, on Dr. Santee. Gotcha. Um, highly recommend that book, by the way, for, for anyone listening or watching this <laughs> into the abyss. Thanks. It's really cool. Um, uh, let's do some, I, because I had some, some intriguing, uh, or you present some intriguing thoughts in that book about a few subjects. Let's just do a rapid fire because I'm okay. curious to see how your how your thoughts have uh, been updated since you published Evolved. it. Okay. Yeah, uh, what what's your current thinking on uh, Bigfoot? Uh, Bigfoot does not exist. What? Yeah, sorry. 
I, I actually want to write a follow-up book called How I Found Bigfoot and Why You Never Will. Um, yeah, I, I, I look, I let a study for 10 years in field research and, and, all, and I interviewed dozens of people uh, and collected massive amounts of evidence. And in the end, it's there, there's no Bigfoot. I've been to Bluff Creek three times. I performed an archaeological uh, dig at the actual spot where Roger Patterson shot his 1967 film. And there's a, a crew up there called the Bluff Creek Film Project, uh, who I know pretty well. And they've got dozens and dozens of trail cameras spread all throughout the wilderness in Northern California. And they have never caught anything that even remotely resembles a Bigfoot. And they found other species that were believed to be extinct. The uh, wow. Humboldt Martin is this tiny little ferret kind of a thing. They actually were able to prove that it still exists because they caught it on their trail camera. But after, it's been 10 years now, I think that program has been going no shot of Bigfoot. Uh, how, how can you, how can you say it's real? So right. yeah, so, I, I, my thinking has evolved from a, to a logical point of view. <laughs> yeah. So, so what do you, I mean, potentially unanswerable question, but what do you think right. is going on when, when these sightings are occurring? When people see things, because people do see things in the woods that they can't explain. But I, I think there are really three, um, three, uh, three, options for every single Bigfoot sighting. Number one is it's a misidentification. No matter how much you think that wasn't a bear or how much you think it wasn't some construction equipment up in a tree or whatever it might be, human beings are very easily deceived by their eyes, okay, and, and their interpretation of what they see, especially in the woods. So it's misidentification. It's a flat-out hoax. The the person is perpetrating a hoax. They, they either took a picture of something they know is not a Bigfoot or they're simply telling a lie or they made a fake uh, Bigfoot track. And these can be very honest people who are, who are actively deceiving you for whatever their own purposes are. So that's number two, it's a hoax. And number three, it's a misidentified hoax, meaning somebody else has done the hoax and uh -huh. I am just a, an unwitting bystander. Now those are the most dangerous ones because I'm an honest person. I'm telling you I saw Bigfoot, why don't you believe me? Well, because Bigfoot isn't real because somebody else was actually hoaxing you. And that's actually most of the footprint evidence is there was a third party hoaxer. The person that found it is very honest and genuine, but it doesn't matter that they're reporting something that wasn't real. Right, right. Through no fault of their own. Do, do you correct, extend correct. that same sort of um, viewpoint to the whole cryptozoological world or is it just Bigfoot that you're feeling that way toward? Uh, yeah, to most of the cryptozoological world. Uh, you know, Loch Ness Monster. I mean, hell, the surgeon's photograph uh, from, I think, 1920s or whatever. That's the thing that kicked off Nessie fever that made everyone think Nessie was real. And that's been proven to be a fake. Right. And that guy was a doctor. A doctor took that picture. So if you can't trust him with the most famous piece of uh, Loch Ness Monster evidence, then who the hell can you trust? Right, right. Um, that's fascinating. Uh, so what, what, let's get back to the rapid fire a little bit. Where, where are your thoughts on um, the greys these days? I, I still believe that greys are time traveling humans from the future. It, very, very highly advanced, evolved uh, human beings from, we'll say, I don't know, 150,000 to two, to, to, to 2 million years in the future. If time travel is possible, human beings or our, forebearers will eventually figure out how to manipulate time. And if they can do that, which I believe we will be able to someday, they will inevitably travel back in time to encounter us. So they, right. to me, it's just a logical thing. And if you look at uh, human evolution, which I have, I used to be an anthropology major in college. Um, if you look at human evolution, what we used to look like and what the trends are, gracile future, features, larger brains, larger eyes, uh, reduced prognostication, which means flatter faces, um, thinner limbs, gracile limbs, all those things, uh, reduced dentition, smaller mouths, all those things together, just extrapolated out a million years and you've got the greats. Hmm. So does that, uh, how does that work in your head with sort of uh, ancient alien stuff? The, the... Yeah, I, I do think that some of that is is uh, is related to to alien time, well, future alien time travel. Yeah, I yeah. do. I actually, and, and again, that can account for everything. If you were an if you were a future human and you had the ability to travel through time anywhere uh, and be safely up in the sky, you know, where you wouldn't 
be impacting what the events below. You would go to everything. I want to see the pyramids being built. I want to see Stonehenge being built. I want to see the Nazca lines. And what you don't realize is you're impacting that. You're influencing how they're making these, um, the, these, these great works from, the, from history just by being there. You know, right. They see the thing up in the sky and they're like, oh, okay, well, let's change the pyramid as if that direction, you know, who right, knows? Right. I wonder too if, uh, if you know, sometimes you, when I hear that theory, I, I, I guess the counter that appears in my head is like, well, that would, I would, I would think then that we would see a lot more of these creatures than we do. But maybe the right. counter to that is, you know, just because we're talking about species in the distant future that are traveling right. back in time, doesn't mean that they themselves aren't still advancing. So maybe they've right. gotten better at it. And what we're seeing is like a certain epoch of aliens yeah. that weren't as yeah. good and, at cloaking. Yeah, and, and I believe that to be true. And actually, if you look at the number of reported alien abductions, you know, it sort of started in the 1940s, 1950s, and it kind of peaked in the 80s. And in the 90s, and now we're in an era where you don't really hear that much about alien abductions anymore. So I think they got what they needed, which was biological specimens from, from previous uh, human iterations. And uh, so they don't need to come back anymore. Right, yeah, yeah. Or at least as much, yeah. Yeah, and were you following the whole disclosure Pentagon stuff? You know, I looked at it a little bit. Um, I, I all, look, I was in the, in the Navy for eight years. I had an above top secret clearance and I used that clearance to get into a lot of stuff that I probably should not have been looking at. Uh -huh. But so I already have inside information, you know, the story tells me what I need to know. And it didn't confirm anything I believed about, about UFOs or aliens, but I was able to eliminate some options, which most people can't do because they don't have access to that information. Sure. Sure. Um, so let's let's pivot a little bit to your time in the Navy. It was okay. it was what about eight years? Is that right? Uh, yeah, two thousand one to two thousand eight. Yeah. And and what specifically were you were you doing in the Navy? I was an intelligence specialist, and uh, my my specific jobs or specialties were foreign country military capabilities and anti terrorism. And uh, before I, I had even joined the Navy, I was kind of obsessed with terrorist groups for some reason. And if I had not joined the Navy, I probably would have become a terrorist. <laughs> um, and so I happened to have joined right before September 11th. I joined January 2001. Wow. And so when September 11th hit, I already knew who Osama bin Laden was. I knew who al Zakari was. I knew the Egyptian Islamic Brotherhood. I knew Al-Qaeda. I knew all that stuff already. And so I was able to just sort of data dump that information into the office that I worked at, the command that I was at, which was the USS Kearsarge, and, uh, and really give them a, a one-up on being able to report things. And I already knew. I said it was either Al-Qaeda or Egyptian Islamic Jihad when, when the attacks happened. I, they were the only ones with sophistication. I had known that for probably five years beforehand. Wow. Wow. So, so I'm curious, in your time in the military, did you, did you come across a lot of like-minded people in, in in terms of esoteric interests no 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 i think i met one person the entire time i was i was in the navy who would who was interested in anything like that and he was even too weird for me <laughs> <laughs> what do you what do you think i mean i'm fascinated with it i grew up in a in a small town in the south that i imagine is, yeah. is a little bit like rural pennsylvania uh, yeah, yeah i come simple. from appalachia yeah, Appalachia, which is we call it pencil tucky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, Tennessee, yeah. and I, yeah. I got a lot of family up in the foothills of the Smoky Mountains, mm -hmm. and I had a grand. Uh, well, I guess she was my great aunt who uh, did not, when I was a child, have indoor plumbing. Um, wow, and that was just, okay. I wasn't quite that rural. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we were, we were poor, rural. <laughs> right, um, right. But by virtue of the way I was raised and where I was raised, I happen to know a lot of people who, who went into service. And right. I always ask this question of them uh, and try to ask it whenever I can of, of anyone that I know that served. Um, what, do you, what do you wish civilians knew about serving in the military that you don't see talked about enough by your estimation? Uh, it, it is a tremendous sacrifice. Uh, it was especially your early years in the military, it, it, it's all sacrifice. 
I was just talking to my mom the other day. We were talking about bad Christmases. And I said, well, my worst Christmas would be the one I spent on duty, on the ship, standing watch out in the freezing cold and on the ocean in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, and I had to do that two Christmases in a row. First one, I had Christmas Eve duty. And then the next one, I had Christmas Day duty. And that was my first two years in the Navy. So, uh, yeah, definitely, you know, you have, you have those kind of sacrifices that the average person would never even think to make, you know. And especially when you're a junior sailor, you know, you're, you spend part of your time, like I just told you all, I'm fighting Al-Qaeda and, and all this other stuff. Well, the other part of the time, I am down on my hands and my knees with a little broom uh, sweeping the passageways, okay? So you've got these two alternate ways of living uh, that are that are very, very opposed to one another. One is that heroic stuff you joined the military for, and the other one are these horrible, dirty tasks that you would never wish on anybody. <laughs> oh, man. Do you, do you still keep in touch with a lot of your... your oh, my goodness, your... yeah. I still have a lot of, a lot of friends from, from those times yeah. because it, it creates this bond, you know, especially when you served on like a ship together or you went to war together, uh, those experiences, uh, you, you can't share that with anybody else. And you, even if you meet someone else who was in the military, you can't talk about how shitty that chief was or how bad that those couple of days were, you know, you've only got that camaraderie with the people you were actually serving with. Right. Right. Um, Man, that's fascinating. So, so you get out of the military, yeah. and what what is the next big leap for you post military? Uh, well, while I was in the military, I actually rediscovered acting, and I had been cast in a bunch of plays and TV shows, and I actually got cast in a movie with Russell Crowe, it was uh, oh. Ridley Scott's Body of Lies, and Leonardo DiCaprio. So I was a huge deal. I mean, I, I got my SAG card out of it and really became a professional actor from that role. And it also told my command, you know, the, the people I was serving under in the Navy that, hey, this guy is serious. He's maybe a little bit too big for his britches here. So they gave me like complete freedom to miss duty for rehearsals and stuff like wow. that. Wow. It was actually, I was, it was pretty amazing my last year. Um, so yeah, so I transitioned out of the Navy very, very easily, smoothly into uh, living in Southern California and being a professional actor. Yeah, it was a pretty smooth transition. Are you still in California? I'm not. I actually just moved two, two and a half months ago to Las Vegas. So I'm living oh, here cool. full time now. Wow. So you're in Nevada right now. I am. Yeah. Whoa. Well, I guess people won't be hearing this until later this month. But, but why aren't they counting the damn the damn I know. Today's the hell are they doing? And right, right. all eyes are on they your state know. right now. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah. Is it tense out there, or is it? How's it feel? Not really. Um, not really, because honestly, people are the state of Nevada is very reliable. It votes uh, red in all the rural areas, which are unpopulated desert. And then in the two major cities, Reno and uh, Las Vegas, which is Clark County and Washington County, it's very reliably blue. And that's where all the population is. So I, I don't know. I personally think Biden is, is going to stay ahead in, in Nevada. So what did, why, why Vegas? Why did you move to Vegas? Um, well, cost of living here is very, very low compared to um, – Los Angeles, especially. Jesus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the place I'm in now is a three story, two bedroom house. Uh, three stories, two bedrooms, and uh, with a yard and, and two car garage. And it is less per month than my one bedroom apartment with no parking was in Los Angeles. So, um, yeah, I just got tired of living a sort of miserable existence in in my hovel in Los Angeles yeah, yeah. and was ready to actually say, Hey, you know, it's, it, it was just like when I looked in the mirror and said, do I really want to keep struggling as, a, as an actor or do I want to go make something of myself? And that's sort of that same transition was, I was just tired of, you know, running in that rat race and not getting anywhere. So yeah, yeah it's cheaper. It's, but it's still a major city. If I get bored, I can any night of the week, get my car, drive 10 minutes to the strip. And boom, I'm in the center of the universe for entertainment. It's it's great. That's pretty cool, man. I've yeah. I've only been there once uh, as an actor, actually. Nice. I, yeah, I was I was traveling <laughs> with this. God, you know these weird gigs you get as an actor. Oh yeah. I had this gig. Uh, this is when I still lived in Tennessee. Actually, this gig with this this woman who had 
a traveling theater troupe that would go to Wyndham Hotels uh, and, and put on shows for would-be investors. Interesting. It was, okay. it was honestly one of the best gigs I've ever had. Oh, yeah. It's yeah, got to be. <laughs> it was so great. The, the show was be. entirely <laughs> improv. You right, rehearsed right. like four times and then you, right. you never rehearsed again. And wow. you got paid like 300 bucks for a weekend and yeah. all your travel was paid. It was, it was actually right, really right. great. Nice. Um, nice. But I was, I, that was my big thing I remember from Vegas, I was 19 at the time and I got <laughs> wasted, <laughs> never asked for ID. <laughs> it was fantastic. Um, uh, I, even when I was there, I thought, I, I don't have any access to this and it drives me somewhat crazy. Yeah. As someone who's lived on the Eastern side of the country for my entire life, my perspective on, on the esoteric generally, and specifically, I suppose, paganism, is very influenced by this East Coast thing where you've got in the West, you've got Sedona, you've got LA, you've got all of these totally different flavors of esotericism. Really. Yeah. How, as someone who kind of grew up closer to this more, I guess, Lori Cabot, Gardnerian right. thing, right. and is now yeah. out there, what has that been like for you? Well, it's a balancing act. Um, and and the, the area that I come from, you have to remember, we are closer on the East Coast to England. So we have, you know, like Sybil Leake came over and I've got all these, she met with that Dr. Santee I was telling you about before and worked with his coven. So her teachings, when she came over and did a tour of America and Alistair Crowley lived over here for a while wow. uh, in, on the East Coast. So their traditions from England, uh, which then come from continental Europe, that sort of magic style is very, very prevalent in, on the East Coast. And what I've been dealing with in California, especially was, um, yeah, they, they really love their crystals and their essential oils and stuff like that, right. which is fine. I have no objection. I have a huge collection of crystals myself. I've actually had to stop and, and give some of them away. Um, but that's just because I like shiny things. Right. Um, <laughs> and the other thing is, you know, the, the only really magical traditions that I found out here are all transplanted. Uh, the Order of the Golden Dawn is, is fairly a fairly prominent magical organization out here, which I'm not a part of, but I have friends that are. Um, because Jack Parsons uh, was based out in JPL at, in right. Pasadena. Right. And he used to be perform rituals with Aleister Crowley uh, over in that area, a place called Devil's Gate. It's very, Ooh. very cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> very, very cool, interesting area that I've been to several times. Uh, actually, it's featured in Cults of Cthulhu, believe it or not. I shot a couple scenes there. Oh, cool. Uh, and uh, so, so you don't have as much of that, you know, the ritual magic is very highly stylized ritual magic. And yeah, the rest of it is pretty much psychics and crystals and, and more of a wellness movement uh, than, than anything else. Does, does any of that sort of Anton LaVey flavor of, of Satanism stuff, is that still kind of in LA? <sighs> you know, I haven't. I've only met one or two people out here who are Le who consider themselves to be LeVay Satanists. So I'd say it's still, it's, it's, um, it is here, but it's not as, as prevalent as say, for example, the golden dawn. And really what's overwhelming is housewives with crystals and psychic readings. That's the, yeah. that's the biggest, the biggest market segment in, in California. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's kind of getting to be that way here too. Although we yeah. also have like hip witchcraft in Brooklyn, right. especially. Right. Um, right. Uh, which but like, I, say for example, in New Orleans, uh, I mean, it's, it's all this dark swamp yeah. witch stuff, which I just absolutely love. It's so cool. Um, yeah. Uh, honestly, if, if I were really moving someplace when I left LA, if I were moving someplace for myself and, and just for my own, like, you know, spiritual practice, I would have moved to New Orleans hands down. That, that, that to me is sort of the epicenter right now of where uh, ritual magic and witchcraft is right now in the United States. What, what's, what is going on there that, that makes you say that? Well, there's just so many people have moved there that are witches and, and run their own, you know, uh, magic shops and occult shops and, and, and book shops and stuff like that. As a result of two, really two things. Uh, the first one was the interview with the vampire, which showed everyone how sexy and dark New Orleans can be. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then the other thing is uh, American, uh, American Horror Story Coven. 
the whole damn thing all takes right. place in New Orleans. So all these witches were like, hmm, if I want to be like Fariza Bulzik in the craft, where should I go? We'll go there. <laughs> <laughs> so those two things, plus it's a beautiful place, you know, and there's so much history there and, and you can feel the, the, the magic, the Haitian voodoo magic in the, in the streets when you walk down it, at least I can, especially at night, you know? And, and it's a place with a lot of energy and it's generally very positive energy and it's the energy of life. You got the swamp all around New Orleans trying to encroach itself on the city constantly. Yeah. And that life, you know, is those old cypress trees that have got those long moving roots. That shit is moving all through New Orleans. So it's a place with a lot of life, a lot of energy. And I think that has also contributed to why so many people um, who are modern witches and, and practitioners of ritual magic and move there. So have you been to Salem? No, no. It's, it's interesting. I've only been to Massachusetts man. twice oh, <laughs> to really? go to Harvard. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, man. It's, it's, a, it's a weird place that I'm obviously fascinated with and think a lot right. about, talk a lot about, but a few, a few very prominent practitioners left Salem fairly recently for New Orleans. Right um christian day being the the biggest christian day and i don't think they're married they might be but christian day and his partner brian kane uh mm -hmm. both went down there so there is kind of a flight coming from all parts of the country it seems yep. uh down there i'm 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 really and i i've expressed this to people to shop owners and stuff in salem uh many times i'm really like a part of me is really disappointed with the esoteric uh, uh, explorations and, and presence in Salem because it's so right. hyper commercialized. Like I was there, um, uh, let's see, I was, I was in town looking for, I don't live there by the way, it's way too expensive to live in Salem out these days, yeah. but um, I live nearby and I was there looking for the Robert Anton Wilson Illuminatus trilogy. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's a book that <laughs> most witch shops you know, in a town should full have. of witch shops, I should yeah. be able to find a Robert Anton yeah. Wilson Illuminatus, yeah. not a trilogy book. I literally went in every single one and not one. I mean, it's it's all Llewellyn, it's all yeah. Wiser, it's all this yeah. like that thing. Yeah. Not dogging on those companies necessarily, right. but but Wiser is actually my distributor for the the mass produced decks. I mean, I don't have any <laughs> the call. Yeah, I don't. No, I don't but have... but but actually, but that speaks to the point I was trying to make earlier, where you know the decks that I created originally are these very dark and and sort of sinister decks that people absolutely love. People who really know about ritual magic love them, and then you get these mass produced things that can be sold to the tourists and can can go to the the crystal loving housewives. How do you feel about that as a, as a creator? Like where, what, what do you, how do you think through it? How do you feel about it? You know, it? The, the truth is the material is exactly the same. It's just like putting a dust jacket on the book cover. So if that's all that's changed, I have absolutely no argument with it because all it's doing is expanding the audience for my materials and putting it in a, something more palatable for them. Um, you know, you want to sugarcoat a pill, as long as the medicine's inside, it's still okay. Well, that's and that's quote. really the way, that, that's exactly the way I feel about it. That's a good quote. Um, I, I've got this question, and, and it, it, it's venturing into strange territory, potentially. Okay. I'd be fascinated to hear your, your uh, opinion on it. Do you think much about the role of masculinity in contemporary esotericism? So, yes, is, is the short answer. I do. Um, there is actually a witch group in Las Vegas, and they don't explicitly say you have to be female. They just say you have to be a witch. So I have, you know, I want to get into the occult and esoteric community out here, but I don't really know how, short of joining their group and showing up to one of their functions. But I am actually concerned that they would not welcome me because I'm I'm a guy and I'm a masculine guy to to make it worse. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so definitely I I do think about that. Um, and the problem with men uh, is that they try to dominate the groups they become a part of, and you have to be able to walk into it and say, okay, well in the in the witch in the, the Alexandrian witchcraft tradition, it's supposed to be a woman who is the high priestess. And you have to be willing to let her call the shots and take a second seat as a guy, uh, or maybe even a third or fourth seat. And most guys are not really willing to do that. Um, 
but I, I personally am, but I sort of run on my own thing now. So yeah. <laughs> um, it, it, it's such a, for me, it's like a, that topic, even reading and thinking about it, not just, yeah. you know, practical applications out in the real world. It's such right. a like strange, I never know how to feel about it. And I find my right. opinion on, on, uh, on it changing constantly because there's a part of me that's like wants to just be like who, who cares right where right. aren't we right. aren't we in this fluid gender space and aren't we trying to get past yeah. these things and aren't these all to some degree just expressions that we've applied to divinity yeah. with a, in an attempt to better understand it so who cares about the designations but then there's another part of me that's like um it, it doesn't do to to you know like you said, domineer these situations. And it certainly doesn't do to, to I don't know, it's, uh, I almost feel like even when I read about the, the divine masculine, a little part of me is like, not sure how to feel about it. Yeah, it makes me very uncomfortable personally. I have a friend, um, her name's Erica. She, uh, over the past two or three years, has started this this very esoteric, womanly, let's get in touch with ourselves kind of a, a program. Let's all become goddesses. And she constantly talks about the divine masculine. And to me, I look at that and say, well, I feel like you're shooting yourself in, your, in the foot here. Uh, you, you spend so much time talking about celebrating men uh, as part of the divine masculine. Well, to hell with that. Celebrate yourself, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I feel like I feel like if we're gonna, if men are gonna celebrate the divine masculine, then men should be right. the ones to do it, right? Right, <laughs> right. yes, sense. I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it would be interesting to see a coven of warlocks, what that would look mm-hmm. like, you know, a, a witchcraft, a witch coven that's just filled with all guys. I, I I don't know if that would be successful. I think they'd probably all get in arguments and fight with each other constantly. I think, yeah, it would make it a year. <laughs> who's get, who's, gonna, who's gonna be in charge, you know? Well, I wanna do it my way. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, this idea of, you know, when I look at, at your, part of the reason I wanted to talk to you is, is when I look at your body of work such as it is, and we haven't even talked about your environmentalism right. stuff, which I want right. to right. before yeah. we get out of here because it's fascinating. But when I look at your body of work and I look at your interest in the occult and the esoteric, mm. I see sort of the tendrils of esotericism and occultism leaking out into all of these different fields that you're in. And I'm, I'm curious how how you conceptualize the marriage of, of especially the art that you're engaged in and the occult. How do those things marry in your mind? So as I said before, you know, I, I believe that these magical traditions are based on truths that have been around for thousands of years. And if they are true, if they are real, then they possess some kind of power. So I have tried to weave that into everything I do. It's just like using you know, if you're going to make a blanket or something and you want to use steel thread in there to help make it strong and strengthen it, well, that's, that's only going to make your blanket better and make it long lasting. And more people will recognize it as true than if you had not done that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there, is it, I mean, I'm thinking of like an Alan Moore or, um, uh, somebody like that, a Grant Morrison, is there, right. is there magical and feel free, I would totally, if I were you, understand if you said, I don't want to answer that. But uh, is there a magical working or series of magical workings going on in your art itself? Um, in some of it, yes. I, I, I can tell you that much. Not in everything, but in some of it, there are 100% is, yes. And, and uh, a few of my things, like if you just read them, it's almost like you know, the Beatles doing the, the backwards subliminal thing, it's almost to that point, but it's not to control you, it's to, to benefit you, it's to allow those things to come into your life and, and make you um, more successful and, and have, you know, a better sense of yourself. And actually, I think the, the proof is in the pudding, you know, my two decks, the Angel Tarot and the Occult Tarot, they sold out within like two or three months of being released, and, and they had not ordered enough copies to meet the, the demand they didn't even know was there. So, People see it, they read it, they experience it, they tell their friend, boom, the friend gets hooked. It's almost, it, 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 it's, all, it's like a holy book, you know, it's like the Bible in a way. Um, the Bible has those strands in it so that when you read it, it enlightens you and it enlivens you and it makes you, and not just the Bible, all holy books really have got that built into them. And so I put that into my work as well, yes. 
Gotcha. I think that's so cool. <laughs> I <think> it's, <laughs> it's fascinating to me. Um, artists who go that route. It's, it's, you know, famously, I guess, uh, Alan Moore, I, I would say, is probably the one who does that the most famously. Yeah. Everything yeah. he did artistically was yeah. some kind of magical working, it seems. Right. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're an interesting guy because it seems to me that because of your military service, and where you grew up, and your interest in the occult, you have like a, 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 a very unique positioning, it seems like yes. socially, culturally, perhaps even politically, are all those things kind of feel true to you? Yeah, I, you know, when I meet people for the first time, I generally say you're never going to meet anyone else like me, and you've never met anyone like me. I'm, I'm, I'm literally one of a kind. And that's not for who I am personally, that's for the experiences that I've had in my life, where I come from, where I've been and, and, and where I'm going. Yeah. What do you feel as someone with such a unique vantage point? What do you feel about, like, I've, I've sort of become, a, not obsessed, but I'm, I'm, I'm every day getting more and more intrigued by, by this notion. And so I'm curious if, if you share okay. similar sentiments, but like, okay. I have this idea that's developing that is that there's something fundamentally wrong and i think it's i don't have it articulated but i think it has yeah. to do with the nature of the individual to the material and spiritual world right. uh there's something fundamentally wrong in the bedrock of western thought yes. that i think the that is related to the individual and, the, and their surrounding that i think the answer might be uh waiting in the world of the esoteric and in the world of the occult do you do you feel similarly have you ever felt similarly to that? I, I agree completely. Um, yes. So, you know, Western civilization, I, I actually tried to create a project a few years ago called uh, the living goddess of the Western world. And I wanted to pick a woman uh, who was basically unknown and try to build Western civilization around her, the whole history of it, even from ancient Egypt, you know, which eventually grew into to Greek civilization, or Roman civilization, and then you've got the Renaissance and, and, and eventually up to, to modern day. And just see what that would look like if I could create a living goddess who was at the top of the pyramid and then this pyramid underneath her of all this Western history and call her a living goddess as though she exemplifies the characteristics of the Western world. Wow. And uh, I eventually quit the project. It got a little too weird even for me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the idea of trying to pitch this idea of a living goddess who basically has no idea what's going on. Um, so it ended up not working. But yes, I, I've really looked into this very, very deeply. You know, I sort of view, um, it's not just the United States, but it's all of Western civilization as a second Rome in a lot of ways. And um, opposed to us on the other side really is, is China and Asian civilization. And I believe personally that that is the way of the future. Actually, I believe it so strongly. Three days ago, I started taking Mandarin lessons. Wow. <laughs> so so I, I do think that in probably 2000 years, Mandarin will be the, the global language the way English is right now. Yeah, I, I had a, uh, a poli-sci class as an undergrad where the basic conceit of the class was to view <laughs> global history through the lens of China yeah. specifically. And it was super, right. It was super enlightening because yeah. when you do that, instead of viewing it through the West, which is how we typically view it here, mm -hmm. the sequencing of events makes, I don't know, it's something about it feels much more obviously like a dynasty, but like a, like a, some, some sort of immortal dynasty, like, like, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, the, this notion of, uh, uh, things being eternal and, and, and uh, will always stretch forward no matter what, even in the face of someone like Mao, who, you know, almost brought the entire thing to ruin. What, what is it, do you think, if you had to guess, or maybe you've thought about it and you know, what is it in, in those cultures that you think specifically is the future that we're lacking here in the West? So in, and I don't have this answer completely figured out, by the way. If I did, I'd probably be living in China right now. Sure. Um, so... <laughs> So one of the strengths of, of the Chinese civilization, and I say Chinese specifically because they've been a country for over 2000 years. You know, they're, they're basically started around the time of, of when the Roman empire really got going. 
and have persisted until, until this day. And they've had their ups and downs, but it's always been China. So one of their strengths is uh, an authoritarian leader. But even in the days of the emperor, when the emperor could just snap his fingers and have any, anyone executed, the emperor didn't actually run the country. He had a whole series of bureaucrats and uh, the eunuchs of the palace that were actually doing that day-to-day -day work and, and making decisions on his behalf without him even knowing. So in the United States, we don't have that. And in most Western uh, societies, we don't have that. You, know, you look at someone like the president, okay, Donald Trump can call the shots, but, but do his cabinet ministers go behind his back and do stuff that he had no intention of having happen? Well, not really, because then they'd be fired. Right, right. But in, in China, that kind of stuff happens all the time. The bureaucrats are actually who's running the country with a very strong authoritarian leader as, the, as sort of the figurehead of everything. And yeah, he does have power. I'm not saying he doesn't. And, and even the current president for life is, is, is acting that way. But that bureaucracy is what I think has saved China all these years, because you could shoot the president in the head. You could have shot Chairman Mao, for example, and that's OK. There are six or seven people underneath him who are ready to fill that power vacuum. Um, yeah, so, so I think that's what it is. It's actually their intricate bureaucracy uh, that has kept them going for so long. Do, do you think that there's anything in the way that the sort of typical Chinese citizen? Well, there's that too. Absolutely. So the, you know, they, they say that uh, for, for hundreds or maybe thousands of years, there were no individuals in China. Everybody thought as a collective that each individual person didn't look at themselves in the mirror and say, oh, I'm me. They said, oh, we are us. And I feel like there's a tremendous strength to that, obviously. How could there not be? Um, the downside to that is what the West celebrates, which is the individual, right. <laughs> you know, what is your individual accomplishment? What have you done? And we've gotten to a point now where, um, you know, the accomplishments of states or even the accomplishment of a country is almost meaningless. You know, if we put a person on Mars today, it wouldn't be the celebration of the United States space program. It would be a celebration of whatever idiot walked off the thing and planted the flag of Nike or Adidas or whoever on Mars, right. you know, yeah, yeah. that would be who, who would we be? We would be celebrating as a celebrity and, Oh, I got my book deal and my talk shows and all that stuff. It would really be pretty disgusting actually. So I kind of <laughs> hope China beats us to Mars because then at least we can celebrate a Nate national space program and you won't even know who the hell the first person was. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, they'll they'll get Adidas. off what they say. Nobody knows. Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, that's fascinating, man. What an, what an interesting perspective. Um, the, the, I, I wonder how the, I mean, we would, I think, need to talk to an actual Chinese person because I, I often frequently wonder the role of things like Confucianism, let's say, you know, matriculating down through the ages oh. and, and, and infiltrating oh. and Buddhism and infiltrating uh, the collective consciousness there. What that has done to the Chinese consciousness that we don't have here, I think you're right, it probably does have something to do with a, a collectivist view of, of the yeah. world, which... I know that China, and I kind of want to pivot into this direction with you. I know that China is, is they're one of the worst polluters in the world, right? Yes. Like, yes. Horrible. But yes. that having been said, don't you think that if they changed their mind, they would be able to turn it around like that? Like it would, it would take yes. very little time. I do. And I think it's just like what happened in the United States. You know, we went through the industrial, um, well, all Western uh, countries, really. We went through the industrial revolution where we were just pouring pollutants and contaminants into the earth and did not care at all because progress was our goal at that time. And then eventually we were like, okay, now we got to start cleaning things up. Let's, let's make things a little nicer. And that's what we did. So if we can pivot on a dime almost like that, then China can do it too. They just recognize right now our goal is is industrialization and building up our country. And once that's done, boom, we switch over to a service economy and everything becomes completely different. Yeah. What, so you, how long have you been personally involved in environmental action? Uh, technically 2001, but uh, really uh, in a meaningful way since 2015. This meaningful way, uh, <laughs> I, I wonder if you would just walk us through, because I, I think me summarizing sure. it would be not as cool as you <laughs> sure. summarizing it. Can you just walk us through the, sure. the foundation of the, the 
you know exactly what I'm talking about. Go for it. Yes. <laughs> okay, so in 2001, when I was in the Navy, I um, discovered as part of my job, I was doing research and discovered that a part of Antarctica had not been claimed by any country. It's about one eighth of the continent, it's a huge area. And I looked into Antarctic law and international law and discovered that there was no prohibition on an individual claiming territory in Antarctica. A country just couldn't claim it. So I went ahead and claimed it. I wrote letters to nine world governments, sent it to their offices of polar programs, and to the United Nations Antarctic Secretariat, and basically said, hey, look, this stretch between 90 degrees west and 150 degrees west is, is all mine now. I'm taking it. And I'm going to protect it from outsiders, and I'm going to use it for my own purposes, basically. And sent it out to these world governments, and nobody ever replied. So I immediately started running it as though it were my own territory and uh, have been doing it basically ever since. There was a brief period where I left the throne, but um, uh, in 2014, late 2014, I decided to um, incorporate it as a nonprofit corporation. And really, I went back to that claimant letter in 2001, pulled out the goals of the organization as outlined there, and put them onto my paperwork to submit as a nonprofit corporation. And they accepted it. So we're actually, we're now tax exempt 501c3 and we cooperate and coordinate with other nonprofit corporations dealing with the environment and protecting uh, Western Antarctica specifically, fighting climate change, protecting penguins, all that stuff. <laughs> so how, how many times, I mean, have you been there? How many times have you been so, there? So uh, that's my most commonly asked question. Uh, <laughs> uh, a reporter from Condé Nast interviewed me, Condé Nast Traveler. And the headline was, he's ruled a country for 15 years. He hopes to see it someday. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great headline. Uh, so I have never been to Antarctica before. And what's funny is now, uh, with the success of Bloodstone Studios, I actually have the funds to travel there if I want to. But uh, it's closed. They've, they've shut down all travel in and out of Antarctica because of the COVID lockdown. So I'm planning on, we actually want to do a fundraiser to do an expedition to, to go down there. Uh, so it's not just me going, so we can take a couple people from, from my organization and uh, a reporter to document and everything else. Uh, we're planning on doing that January of 2022 will be the actual expedition that we're, we're hoping to launch. So yeah, we're, we're doing, we're gonna launch a fundraiser here in, in a couple of weeks and try and raise that money over the course of next year, which is our 20th anniversary next year. Oh, wow, wow. Yeah. How many people yeah. are a part of your, and what is your official title? So uh, my official title is His Royal Highness Grand Duke Travis of West Antarctica. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, I have got, we've got about 2,300 citizens who are all, of course, virtual citizens. And I've got about nine, I think, cabinet ministers who are volunteers who help me manage and administer the sort of day-to-day -day of, uh, of running a government and running a company. Um, my chief operating, and then these people have actual titles in the corporation as well. So they're not just, you know, minister of communications is also our director of communications on the corporate side. And I'm, I'm not just um, Grand Duke Travis, I'm also executive director of West Arctica. So um, my chief operating officer is the, the prime minister and uh, he's, he's done an amazing amount of work. We just elected him uh, last year actually wow. uh, for a four year term. And uh, he's done a tremendous amount of work for us. Um, and you know, we go to um, uh, public gatherings and public events and give speeches. And I do, like I said, I've, I've done multiple interviews already. Uh, most of them were about West Arctica, believe it or not. <laughs> I believe it. I mean, it's fascinating. What, um, what is it like? I mean, what is the day to day of, of running it? Well, a lot of it is emails, um, but also, you know, recognizing people's accomplishments. You know, a lot of our citizens want to go above and beyond because they give out knighthoods and you get an actual medal and everything else so, and titles of nobility as well. So a lot of that inspires our citizens to do things that they would not normally do in pursuit of helping the environment. For example, uh, one of our guys, Trevor Stratton, he actually uh, uh, adopted a highway on behalf of West Arctica. So in just outside of St. Louis in a place called Hannibal, Missouri, there is a, 
a sign that, you know, dock the highway with West Arctica on it. And he actually goes out and picks up trash. I think he has to do it once a quarter or something. Wow. And so, you know, that's deserving of a knighthood. Um, and, and there's other little things like that that people have done on, on behalf of the organization that have actually helped make the world a little bit of a better place. Um, but you know, we have a great social media presence on Twitter, uh, which I don't run, thank God. My, my minister of communications handles all that. We have a very robust uh, Facebook group for our citizens. And like we just had an art contest, a writing contest, uh, all, all kinds of stuff like that that we try to engage people to think more about the environment and think about their place in, in the great ecology of, of the world. Right, is that your ultimate goal, is, is awareness? It is, yeah. That that really is one of our chief. Um, there's people who still think that penguins live at the North Pole and polar bears are at the South Pole. You know, we try to fight those kind of things. Uh, uh, try to educate people and, and raise awareness. Yeah, it's a big, a big part of our goal. Gotcha. Is there? Uh, I mean, is is there? Is there a desire in you once you do go on the expedition yeah. and go actually set? foot in your right, land. Right. Um, is there any desire for you to 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 actually inhabit the space or, or have people inhabit it? There, there is, yeah. Um, but that is both costly and very, very um, risky. Mm -hmm. So for me to inhabit, to really become the Grand Duke of West Arctica and to actually have legal ownership over that wedge of land that I've claimed, um, I would have to forfeit my American citizenship. I, you know, the Queen of England can't also be a citizen of Norway or whatever. Right. You know, she she she's got to be her own thing. So I would have to forfeit my citizenship, as would anyone that came to live there, to be considered permanent residents. Otherwise, we're just Americans squatting in Antarctica, and America could still come in and have power or jurisdiction over us. But if we forfeit our American citizenship and we live in a place where no government has jurisdiction, we become the jurisdiction of that place wow. and that that's sort of basic international law now whether or not other countries want to recognize us that's on them I, I can't control that but um yeah we would have to have the permanent population of a of a space that isn't controlled by any other world government and that would be very risky and very expensive i mean it costs tens of millions of dollars to operate in antarctica on a permanent basis because logistics there are so damn expensive it, Western Antarctica is the most remote place on planet Earth. There's a reason nobody has claimed it because nobody wants to go through the expense of operating there all the time. Right, right. So, you know, just the logistics of getting food and fuel and all that stuff uh, in and out of Antarctica, you know, two, three times a year. I mean, that alone is, is probably a million dollars in cost. Wow. So, yeah, it, it's very expensive, very risky. And if something happened to us, this is the worst part. You know, we're not protected or governed by any country. So if something happened to the research facility or I broke my leg or woman goes into labor, uh, we're on our own. You know, we have to figure it out ourselves, just like pioneers uh, were, you know, coming to America in the early days. That's a hard sell <laughs> for it sure. <laughs> Believe me, it is. Yeah. But the free, but the the, the trade-off is absolute freedom, complete, absolute, total sovereignty from any other government or law or anything else. You can literally do whatever you want. I mean, so the Bank of West Arctica, yeah. we can have the West Arctic <laughs> Casino, whatever you want to have, we we can have. So the advantages are there, but the the dangers are really really prominent. And the worst part is, uh, you know, Russia could just one day decide, well, I think I want that research station. Send in armed forces, and we're done. You know, might makes right. They could they could topple us in, in 10 minutes, but we'd have no recourse. Who do we go to to say, hey, help us out? We're not Americans. We're not anything. Right. We're West Arcticans. So we'd have to have our own military force to, to defend against those kind of things. Uh, yeah. So so there's definitely a lot of danger in that that dream of permanent sovereignty or permanent habitation. But um, whatever, it's 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 a fun little dream. It keeps me going sometimes. Yeah. When I, that's when I really get sad cool. about life. <laughs> yeah. What, what would you do? I mean, let's say, let's say, you know, uh, let's have fun with it. Let's say you're down there with, with 5,000 citizens. You've got right. some sort of blockchain currency set up. Right. You're, you're making it work. What, what do you think it, if you're there and you're all, you know, territorializing this, this wildly unterritorialized space, right. I imagine, or I, I assume that you've, you've thought about that. Imagine what, have, what you would yeah. want to do. What does that look like to you? Well, first of all, we actually would use a blockchain. We had our own um, currency called the West Arctica coin two years ago, and it ended up 
we did it as an experiment for about a year and it was very successful. We actually raised a lot of money that way. Not tons of money, but enough to, to call it a success. Right. And then we, it sort of collapsed in on itself. But, um, but so we have some experience with blockchain currency. That is what we would use. And, uh, you know, I envision a community of like-minded people, but also of scientists. You know, I really would like to create a premier sort of um, uh, habitation down there that is not based on all these very industrial science uh, uh you know, basically Connex boxes with, with padding in them mm -hmm. is what most of these uh, scientific research stations are. I would want to base it on like the Las Vegas casinos, bright, airy, open spaces. I dreamed of having the first uh, tree planted in, in Antarctica. You know, we could have a huge park with like a large um, dome over it, sort of like the Apple uh, headquarters, not Apple headquarters, the, what's that in Seattle, Amazon headquarters in Seattle, you know, and, and a big tree in a central space. And that kind of, of life that scientists would want to come and spend time there and do their research in Western Antarctica. Because right now there isn't a, a permanent habitation there where they could spend two, three years studying the ice cores and then studying the animal life and all that stuff. So that's actually I wouldn't want to have 5,000 people. That's too many at first. Um, I, I was thinking more along 60 crew, and then we'll say maybe 40 or 50 visiting scientists there at, at any given time. That's actually what my dream is, to create a place where scientists can come free from the encumberments of any world government and, and really conduct the kind of science that needs to be conducted in Western Antarctica. Because the ice is melting more and more every day. And uh, I, I would like to try and put a stop to that if possible. Yeah. Um... Man, that's fascinating. You know, you don't you don't often meet people who are are willing to like actually do something. <laughs> um, was there a specific event that sort of spurred you into wanting to do something, or? Um, not really, but just the you know studying climate change as I have over the past probably ten years. Um, that was really what made me say, hey, uh, I think something needs to be done about this. I happen to be in a position where I can somewhat do something. So let's, let's marry those two things together. And, and the other thing was I had been doing West Arctica for so long, I eventually said, well, okay, I quit acting because it wasn't productive. So am I going to keep doing micronationalism if it's not productive? You know, what am I gaining out of this? The answer was nothing until I shifted the mission and the purpose of West Arctica to conservation of the environment. Now I had a reason to keep going and it made it much more exciting and, you know, gave it a purpose that other people could get behind. It wasn't just about let's make Travis the king of Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it could be, but it's nice that it has loftier goals. It, it, yeah. <laughs> Um, well, this has been absolutely fascinating, uh, as I thought it would be. You're, 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 I mean, not to end this by blowing too much smoke up your ass, but, but you're a real inspiration to me in terms of an actual free thinker in the world of the esoteric, which you think would not be hard to find, but it surprisingly is. People are so rigid in their beliefs. I mean, it's, it's just like an organized religion in a lot of ways. And to find someone who's not bound by, by some kind of specific dogma, even in the in occult practices, is really really challenging. Yeah, yeah, but I definitely count you among among that. Where where Thank can you. our uh, listeners and and viewers check you out if they want more information about you? Well, the best place is travismckendry.com. That's my my overall website. You can click on all the different links there, and it'll take you to you know Bloodstone Studios, which is my tarot card company, or WestArctica.info, which is um, of course my my micronation and and the other stuff as well. <laughs> That's got to feel cool to say out loud. It takes you to my it micronation. <laughs> it does. <yeah. laughs> all right. Thank you so much for coming on the show, man. This has been great. No problem. It was good talking to you, Joel. Hey, thanks so much for listening to the Salem Witch Podcast. Please do subscribe to this podcast on whatever platform you are finding it on. Rate it, review it, leave comments, put into the engagement so that the views will go up. I understand that's how these things work. Please share it all over the place as well. I'm really, 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 really loving talking to people uh, on this show. So if you have someone or you are someone that uh, you think might fit well on this show, drop me a line at joel at twosalem.com. That's J-O-E-L at T-O-S-A-L-E-M.com. You can find Two Salem across social media profiles, usually under Two Salem site. We are on Twitter, Instagram, and 
and Facebook at the moment, and also, of course, YouTube, which is the primary one. Uh, this was a fantastic conversation. I really, really love this. Thank you so much for listening to it. Please do check out all of Travis's work. Also, links in the description for that. I will see you next episode. Stay weird, witches. See you next time. Bye-bye.